Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. My name is Josh Brownlee and I'm joined today by Rod Green. Rod, welcome. Great to have you here today. Good morning, Josh. Nice to be here. Excellent. Uh, Rod is a public health engineer with over 40 years experience in the construction sector, specialising in internal and external drainage systems design for a wide variety and scale of projects. Engaged in water conservation and sustainability through designing water recovery and reuse systems, blue and green roof systems, suds water management systems and flood risk assessments. Rod gained his undergraduate degree in his early 30s and his Masters of Science in Civil Engineering Management in his mid-50s, proving it's never too late to learn. Rod has worked with Syria, becoming being a member of the PSG group for both the Suds Manual and the soon to be released Blue Roof Guide, and is currently one of the lead authors for the new Sibsi Guide G document. Presently regional coordinator for Sophie Midlands, on a personal level, Rod is a very passionate in improving environmental and social justice related to local, national and global water issues and challenging impacts on our planet today. That's quite an introduction, Rod. It is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> so what, what does it all mean? Suds, Syria, you know, there's there's quite a few acronyms there. It's, um, well, Suds is sustain Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems which um, is, has been around now for probably best part nearly 20 years or, so, or probably over 20 years. But I think a lot of us were designing SUD schemes before SUDs became sort of what it is today. Um, Syria is there, Syria are an independent um, research um, company as such but they provide industry backed um, guidance for a lot of different um, applications not just drainage but they cover a wide range of applications so uh, I've sort of morphed into doing a lot of that work over the years um, as part of my role of a, as a public health engineer and public health being the water and drainage, so the, the the drinking water, the washing water, rather than the heating water. Yeah, it's um, I, when I started, you used to do domestic water, domestic heating, gas, medical gases. Um, but nowadays, the bulk of my work is based around drainage and I do do uh, incoming water supplies. Um, because that ties in with a lot of the recovery work I do for wastewater as well and for rainwater, so yeah. Okay, but what you don't get involved with is the heating systems or the process water, water for any manufacturing, no. but it no. is the drainage associated with it and... Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. So we pick up all of that. And how did you get into the industry? Um, my dad was a plumber. I became a rough ass plumber um, and uh, sort of realised that I really, well, the, the guy I was mating used to clip me around the ear roll quite a lot because he said I asked too many questions and it was trying to understand how things worked and why we did what we did. And so I really enjoyed the theoretical side of it and that sort of led me moving then off the tools into um, an office work first started first company I worked for was JS Wright it's in Birmingham um, and yes yeah, started off at the bottom doing the printing everything else and working my way through estimator through to con working on contracts and eventually starting to get into design work. JS Wright still going strong obviously. They are yeah fair play to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, what about qualifications, early school years? Um, I left school with next to nothing. I was a, I was an idiot at school, probably when I look back at it. Um, but I then did a foundation course at Hall Green Tech. I think it's now South Birmingham College. Um, and went on from that to do an indentured apprenticeship. So I did um, my higher technical certificate in plumbing, drainage, heating, 
um, at Hall Green Tech and then went. I actually managed, I'd got my cities and guilds after two years instead of four. And then I did an advanced um, course in uh, higher tech and that was based around plumbing and drainage systems. Excellent. And um, what was your first NG? You mentioned JS Wright. That was your first uh, job out of university college. No, um, what I, I never went to university. College was uh, in them days for us. I'd got an indentured apprenticeship with Birmingham City Council, and then had one day a week at college um, because of the way I was moving it forward. Uh, I was doing two nights plus a whole day at college in my last. Um, year there and uh, when my apprenticeship finished uh, there was a bit of a lull and Birmingham City Council laid off about 50 apprentices at the time and I was fortunate that my college lecturer knew a guy called Peter Marsh at J.S. Wright and convinced him to interview me and that was how it moved forward. <laughs> Any, any work experience with your dad, Go, you know, helping out as a follower, as a fetcher and carrier? Oh, God, yeah, I could I, I could plumb out a house when I was like 14, 15. Um, and my dad was brilliant with lead, taught me how to work lead. Um, and so it was, uh, yeah, I was I was lucky I'd got that background. As, as in well. lead pipe work? As in lead pipe work and lead sheet work as well. So um, it, it showed me how to sort of work lead and create box, um, sort of box gutters, all that type of stuff out of lead. OK, so that's what, for rainwater gutters on your house rather than UPVC yeah, that we've got nowadays? Oh, absolutely. Them days it was all, it was, UPVC was sort of just coming into the, into play, um, but it was all copper, lead. Um, and I, mean, I can remember ripping out old asbestos Soil stacks and everything, and it's like you know you wouldn't go near them nowadays. But then days no, it's totally different. No face mask, no gloves. Not to begin with, no. Anyways, no, no protective equipment or or um, you know risk assessments or anything along those no, lines. No, no. Health and safety has moved on massively since yeah. them good old days. Yeah, and um, mid fifties going into an MSc, so a degree. What what uh, prompted you to to um, want to get another qualification? I, I'd done my undergraduate at Coventry University when um, in my mid thirties and I got asked at that time, my final year projects on that was constructed wetlands um, or read, also known as sort of read beds. And that sort of got me into um, thinking more about the environment and how what we do as P, uh, PH engineers and that can help impact the environment in a positive way. Um, and I got offered um, to do an MSc, but I was, I paid my way through that. Um, I was, I'd been made redundant by Ovarup at the time because um, it was the 90s recession. Um, and so I did, I got through the recession doing um, my undergraduate and spending like weekends and evenings doing fitting bathrooms, central eating systems and the like um, in my own time uh, as well. And then I always wanted to do an MSc, couldn't afford to do it, went back in working um, again, uh, Arabs took me back on, um, I think it was 93, but I just, with family and everything else, just couldn't find the time to fit it in. Then I decided, um, I think it was uh, 2015, something like that, that if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. And so did MSC part time. And that was what, evening, night school, day release, block release? Um, had a sort of day release for that um, as such. So, um, I, the company I was working for at the time was really good. They let me have the time to go to university. I used to make it up and still cover my hours, but they, um, they let me um, have the time to go and do that. And yes, yeah, so it was 
a lot harder than what I thought, a lot, a lot more work than what I thought it would be. And going back into academia when you're that old and haven't done it for years and years, that was a massive shock to the system. But, but, but I, I thoroughly I enjoyed it. I guess there are others in, in a similar situation to you as well, but obviously maybe in the minority. There was, there was on, across the course, there was about 50 odd students and I think there was two of us who were, uh, there was a young, younger lad who I got on great with, but because we both going through the same type of thing, we got on really well and worked together really closely through it all. And he's remained a really good friend ever since. So, um, yeah, shared experience and all that. <laughs> yeah, it's good, good having that support network and and uh, having somebody going through similar things as you and and uh, being able yeah. to bounce off them, isn't it? Yeah, and we lived re fairly close to one another, so it was uh, of an evening we could get together and go through stuff and help one another out. And with his experience and my experience, it, it really helped. I think we were the only two. Who, we both ended up with distinctions, and I think we were the only two who did. But we worked really hard and put the time and effort into it. Yeah. Is there someone who supported your professional development that you'd like to acknowledge? This, I've, I've always said I've had two two guys who've been um, my real mentors. Um, a guy at How Engineering, Derek Jones, uh, bless him and hope you rest in peace. Um, he was instrumental in really pushing me uh, in my early design days and what he didn't know about plumbing and drainage. Um, it was just incredible. And there was also a guy at um, Arabs called Andrew Davis, who again, uh, I learned so much from him, absolutely so much from him. And both of them were massively instrumental. And I suppose my dad for sort of um, teaching me <laughs> Um, when I was really young and let me go and mess about with him when he was working on projects. So, yeah. And what about the, the younger generations? Anyone that, uh, any graduates or apprentices or STEM work that you're doing and, and uh, recognise them? I don't, the, I mean, I, I, the company I've got, I work at, at the moment, uh, Pluvium Environmental. Um, it's a young company. Uh, me and a colleague set it up earlier on this year, so we've got no graduates with us. Where I was working before they just before we left, they had a couple of graduates start, and there was one of the lads there who um he worked closely with me and my colleague uh John. And uh, it's amazing what they where they are technically now well, techno technological wise now compared to what we used to do. I mean, nobody goes out with a staff and a leveler or anything nowadays, and it's you know, it's all done with drones and everything, and it's what the bloody hell. I'm, but it's incredible how, how things have moved on from that. And it's amazing how much I was learning from him, let alone him from me. Yeah. Um, what about sustainability and renewables? Um, <clears throat> sustainability, well, SUDS is a s sustainable drainage. Um, and my main project for my MSc I tried to highlight that by managing and recovering and reusing water actually had a massive impact on things like carbon. And water's always thought about, people think about water about either drought or flooding, whereas if they actually think, put water more central to what they're doing and what they're thinking about from a sustainable point of view. Um, it actually has a massive impact, not only on um, on having more possible water to be able to drink, but also on the building and the life of buildings and how buildings work and the amount of energy buildings use it really does have a massive effect if you've got blue green roofs, if you've got the proper shading, if you're recovering water, reusing it, the benefits are massive, um, both from an environmental point of view, from a carbon point of view, and also from a biodiversity and amenity point of view. And I think that is just slowly starting to come more and more to the fore now. 
because of course um technically you could drink the water out of a, a toilet cistern it, it it's it's able to you know it comes yeah, from the same source water. as what comes out of your tank out yeah. of your tap, the, sorry the biggest thing is perception people what people don't realize is when we had the big bang and we the earth was created we created an atmosphere um and the water that we've got in that atmosphere when we had the big bang is the same water we use now we don't it doesn't rain from outer space it only comes from our atmosphere so we it's the water we've got has been here for billions of years um and, and if you think that um we drink people i say to people of oh, we can use gray water we can use black water and they sort of turn the faces or turn the noses up yet yeah, they'll drink the water out the thames that's just full of shit really so it's yeah sorry rubbish but it's all treated um so there's no difference to doing um treatment within a building and reducing the amount of actual potable water that needs to be supplied to us than drinking the water out the thames and having it treated except you're going to save a lot of energy you're going to reduce carbon massively and the impact on the environment is going to be reduced massively. By potable, it's uh, water suitable for drinking is, is the yeah. definition, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, technically, have uh, are, are we drinking the same water that dinosaurs drank? Absolutely. It's just it's been filtered either through rock or through, uh, you know, uh, our local water authority filtering it and purifying it and turning it from what's gone down our toilet into something that's able to be drank. Absolutely. That's and all it is. You mentioned blue and green roofs. What's the difference one to the other? Um, well, a, a green roof is typically just a, a roof with vegetation on it, whereas um, a blue roof. If you think green nature, blue water. So a blue roof has got an element of um, attenuation or storage on the roof. Um, and it's you, you think of urban areas. A lot of people with suds, they design um, a drainage system with a big tank on the end of it and uh, oil, oil interceptor or wherever else they, they've got all big stuff big pipes deep in the ground. But if you start thinking about the building and the spaces on and around the building, you can actually capture and recover and reuse water at, uh, at source. And, and, that's, and any temperature in it as well? Yeah, so of course, if you've got insulation during the winter, you've got, uh, if, you're, if you've got a, a blue green roof or a green roof, during the um, summer periods, you've got pooling. I mean, we build, we put shade in around buildings. Why not do green shade in around buildings? Why not recover your, the rainwater, the grey water, the condensate, and use that for your irrigation systems? And it's starting to happen more and more now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, we, I mean, people think it's all brand new technology, but this has been going on for thousands of years in areas where water scarcity is um, more prevalent. I mean, we're lucky where we live in the UK. Uh, geography wise, we've got a temperate climate. Not everywhere in the world is like that. I worked out in the Middle East for a few years and their old attitude towards water and water conservation and water reuse completely different to ours because there's nothing stopping the water from your shower or from your bath being used to flush the toilets and then no. the toilet water then goes away for processing to be then turned back into water that's suitable for drinking yeah a, a really good example and and this it, I, I use this quite a lot the sydney olympic games the athletes village um, I've been and visited there since it's now residential development and they are not fully, but they're nearly what I call water neutral. All their rainwater, all their grey water, all their black water is all collected, it's all treated and it then goes back through the system and it's it's treated that much, it's even used for possible water. 
So the only mains cold water they really rely on is for top up. So it's a little ecosystem in within itself, water ecosystem within itself. I I worked on the uh, 2012 Olympics, and we didn't even recover rainwater and reuse rainwater. All this all, all this stuff that was being spouted about um, how sustainable they were and what they were trying to do, all the ground works and the ground um, uh, reclamation works and that um, that was brilliant, but nothing else was done. And I found that really frustrating and it was like going backwards. If they could do that years before in Sydney, why aren't we doing that as part of like the residential, what became the residential village and is now, um, sorry, the athletes village and has now become residential areas. Why couldn't that have been done in London? But they just, I, mean, I suppose it's all down to cost, but but it, it, the technology is there, the understanding is there to do all this type of stuff. Yeah, and you mentioned grey water and black water. Is that the the physical colour of the water, or is there some other way of no, defining? No, grey water is your waste water from your baths, your showers, um, laundry to a point, um, your sinks, your basins, and stuff. Black water is from your WCs, so that's Toilets. that's containing um, um, a lot more. Uh, Nest, uh, nasties within the water, so that's what needs a lot more treatment. Grey water still needs really needs to be treated, depending on what it's being used for. But as I say, it's we know how to do all this. Uh, you've got projects where recovering things like black water is probably not um, ideal because it's not really cost effective. But when you've got high rise residential buildings, then collecting um, Grey water, black water, is and rainwater is cost effective. You got high rise uh, off, uh, office blocks. Again, might not be cost effective collecting black water, but grey water, condensate. Why we don't use con collect and reuse condensate? I've got no idea. It just goes to drain. Condensate from cooling systems. From 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 mechanical vent systems. Yeah, cooling. So pan units, everything else where where cooling is involved and you've got condensate, gain a little bit of treatment and that water's it's all free water. Yeah, and that reduces your your uh, water bills and uh, increases the, the sustainability in the um, uh, re yeah, uh, um, reduces the bills and, and reduces your yeah. consumption. Absolutely. So um, and it also it also takes pressure off the external water mind yeah, as well. Yeah. And all the money it costs to I mean, when you think you look at your water bills, 30 percent of that is goes to pay somebody's shares. And yet we our wastewater is taken away. It goes towards treatment plant. It either gets dumped illegally now into a river or the sea as part of the CSO or it's fed back, it's treated, fed back into the um, as possible water. And then it our, most of the systems have got ridiculously high leakage rates and yet we're paying for all that. In our bills. In our bills. It's yeah. it, it to me to me personally, it's criminal. Um, I think what's been done with the water industry over the last few years with deregulation is completely wrong. Um, and we waste. A if you think without water, none of us would be here. Yeah. And yet we just completely abuse and mistreat it. So um, rainwater obviously falls on our roofs and on our paths externally. Yeah. But Presumably it contains um, debris, you know, silt and leaves yep. and various other bits and pieces. And in the same way, water from our sinks and from our dishwashers and cleaning and water from our. So that contains food debris, maybe. Um, and then our, our showers and our, our baths and our, our basins all contain soap suds and, and shower gel and hairspray and what have you. What happens to, to all of that lot to, to make it suitable to be drunk again? It, it just has to be treated correctly. Um, Rainwater is fairly easy to treat. Like you've said, it, um, it use filtration systems. I'm very 
mindful that it, what the end use is, because the end use will dictate how much you have to treat. Um, and specifically with um, irrigation systems, if if you're doing a uh, passive irrigation type of systems, um, then you probably don't need to treat as much. But if you're doing sprinkler type irrigation systems and demisting systems, then obviously you have to think about um, the fact that the water is like an aerosol that people can breathe in. So you make sure you take it through proper UV disinfection and everything that needs to be done to bring it to a level that it's it's not harmful anyway. And also the people who are installing the systems who are maintaining the systems, you have to think about uh, those people as well. Um, and that's what I suppose that's why it's termed as public health engineering, because you have to think about the health consequences of all this. Yeah. So. And, and that that rainwater system for irrigation, that's a that's a watering system for your your plants and shrubs and you know, yeah. Outdoors that, and the grass that, that areas. Can, that can also, yeah, it can be used for for car washing. Can be used for the laundries for laundry for so you could refeed it back to use for your laundry water, toilet flushing. But that system doesn't starve those plants from the rain in the first place. It just uh, it gives a, provides a, a storage tank for the water for when it's not raining in in the instance of a drought or a, uh, a dry mm -hmm. season. Well, not not. I mean, you, you have a summer like this summer and the, there are regulations you have to work within and you can only store water for a certain period of time um, because the water will um, start to deteriorate. So you get summers like we've had this summer and to store enough water, you'd never be able to store enough water for rainwater for that um, as such. But it does help um, with so it's just, especially in this country, it's very rare, although it is getting more extreme and starting to happen more where we do get longer, drier summers and we're even getting drier winters. So um, I've seen irrigation systems being used during the winter months now because it's been so dry. Yeah. But it's 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 just making understanding what you're doing and making sure you can you're designing and controlling. but. You can only go so far and that's why when you start looking i mean grey water if you've got a building that's occupied you've got consistent grey water so you can use that for your irrigation you can treat that and use that for your irrigation if you've got um office buildings you've got the condensate if it's occupied again it's consistent water yeah that would normally go to waste and process that would normally go down to a drain yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, the, you, it, you've got to be practical about it. It's got to be effective and cost effective and efficient. But yeah, there's there's just a lot of ways we can rethink how we do things, I think. And the technology and the understanding of a lot of this is now there within the industry to do it. Now, I, I know you've got a few NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, which prevent you from talking too much about uh, certain things. But um, I know that you, you've got some uh, innovation and innovative products and, and ideas that you can uh, think of. Can you uh, share some of those ideas and, and products and processes with us? Um, we're sort of involved in a few things at the moment, um, and it's working with um both manufacturers and with academia and looking at um natural materials and media that can be used for treatment is is one of them and that is really exciting um particularly when it comes to um highways car parking areas etc and it's just um a way of being able to keep everything at sort of at source, shallow collection, shallow treatment, but actually getting away with um, having to think big, deep tanks. And that one, if that is uh, really exciting, I think that is going to evolve more and more um, in the future on a lot of projects. Uh, is there a timeline to that? How quickly do you think that'll be? Uh... 
Um, well, it's it's sort of it, it's been done in a fashion already now, so it's just another way of um, of thinking about doing it. Um, so I there's there's a couple of three projects that we're already looking at with it. So and there's there's been a lot of research work gone into it, actual on site trials and stuff. So um, the other thing that's really being pushed um, in different uh, guys is, is actually controlling the flow water from roofs, but linking that to weather systems um, and understanding when you can release water from areas from roofs um, into the drainage system, which helps the water companies then manage um, their assets a lot better as well. Okay, sounds exciting. You you keep us abreast on uh, any developments and changes there. Yeah, I think it'll be all sort of it's it's all slowly coming out into um, the wider world anyway. But it's um, yeah, it's it, it's looking at. I mean, na we nature is really good at looking after itself and sorting itself out, and it's using their natural processes to do more as opposed to using energy con um, processes that use a lot of um, consumption that we don't really need to use. And trying to, instead of having large centralised systems, sort of downsize a little bit and control things a lot closer to home. And um, how do you see your roles changed or the role of a, a public health engineer has changed recently? Um, I can only speak personally. Mine has evolved into an area that I never even dreamt of. I mean, I just thought I'd be designing drainage water systems for buildings. Um, and that's that's still the mainstay of a public health engineer. but. There's so much more that where public health engineering can take you, which I've learned over the years, particularly with uh, sustainability. And, and an exciting time setting up your own company as well. Exciting and um, yeah, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> Challenging. Challenging is another way, yeah. <laughs> where did the name Pluvium come from? Pluvium is Latin for the rains. OK. So it was, um, um, uh, we sort of talk about pluvial and fluvial flooding and everything. And it just, we just sat there one night trying to come up with something and pluvium, well, pluvial got mentioned, then it became pluvium and it just stuck. So it sort of, it, it uh, epitomises what we're trying to do, I think, a little bit. And did you study Latin before? You you knew that Absolutely obviously not. from no? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm not that old. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it, it's a term that you're obviously familiar with and uh, is is used there. So uh, yeah, no, it, it, that, that 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 makes sense. But um, um, what about any other institutions other than SIBSI or professional bodies? Um, I've I've been a fellow. I'm a fellow of Sophie. I've been a fellow for the Institute of Plumbing for oh, donkey's years so uh i um i d i don't get involved with the institute's plumbing as such uh like i used to years ago there used to be um a really good branch set up in birmingham that i used to attend and everything um but i find the iop is more orientated towards actual installers which i have sleep don't do as such anymore unless I'm playing around at home. Um, so it's uh, so Sophie, I think, has been um, a real good institution, uh, institute. And the fact it's tied to SIBC, I think, has really helped because I think it's helped drive public health and what public health is about within SIBC. And Sophie being S-O-P-H-E, the Society of Public, Society Health, of Public Health Engineers. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really driven that um, what PH engineers are about within SIBC, which I think, again, before, I think we were sort of like a, a second cousin 
Whereas now I don't, I think we're a lot more prevalent within Sibson. And you get involved and organise quite a lot of the uh, events for, for Sophie in the West Midlands region with all of the fellow network of uh, engineers. Yeah, there's not there's not uh, loads of us, but um, before COVID, we were having probably about eight or nine events a year. Um, we're trying to get one sorted out for just before Christmas um, this year for obvious reasons. Uh, regarding hospitality afterwards um, and then next year we're, we're already talking with um, manufacturers to come and have a chat with us face to face again and hopefully we'll get seven or eight together for next year as well. And they're not just death by PowerPoint and like you said there's, there's a oh, bit of a social networking part there the, as well. Yeah and I'm also very, um, I'm a pain in the arse with them I think because I, I like this whatever they talk about to be relevant and if they say oh we're doing this it'll be okay we know who you are we don't really want a lot on the company but pick a subject it's got to relate to something that we're all involved with and we all understand and that to me is more important because it is I class it as a technical event and it's got to have technical content in it and are those, is that just a, a closed door thing just for public health engineers or is that open to anybody in the construction industry? No, it's open to anybody. We've, um, it's it's really strange. We get obviously the PH fraternity come along, but we've had architects turning up, um, particularly when we've done stuff on, um, but we've done a couple of really good seminars regarding uh, blue roofs and blue green roofs and that. And we had quite a few architects turn up for that. Um, we get other manufacturers coming along as well. So it's open to anybody who wants to walk through the door. And, and civil engineers us. as well, I guess, and, and developers. Yeah. yeah, anybody. Yeah, we've had mecha we've done a couple on water. We've had mechanical engineers turn up for that. So it's, I've even been along to some. Yeah, so it's, you know, we get we get quite a good cross-section there's there's not lots and lots of us but um it's it's good way to, for everybody to sort of uh, there's a hospitality side but you're sort of meeting um my, uh, like minds you've got a lot of us are, um, especially in the midlands we're all fairly close we all know one another and so it's a great way of meeting up and catching up with one another and everything so it is a social event as well as you're getting a bit of technical um, hopefully information as well to help you in your day to day working long. Yeah, knowledge and, and sharing. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career like yours? Go for it. I, That's I all I would say to anybody. Don't, if, if you think there's something you really want to do, don't hold back. Just go for it. It might not happen overnight. Um, and it might evolve in a different way to what you think it would, but it, life's what you make it. And it's, I've been really lucky. Um, my life's been based on land drainage mainly, and so like effluent and crap, but I'm one of those lucky people who I get up in the morning and work's not a chore. I enjoy what I do. I love learning that every day's a school day and, um, I don't have to, I'm, I'm not in a factory doing stuff. My, it's taken me all over the world. I mean, I've done projects in the Americas, Australia, um, Asia, Middle East and stuff. And I've been fortunate, I've been able to visit a lot of these places. So yeah, to, if, if you're interested in it, just go for it. But, but don't think it's going to happen overnight. And don't think, a lot of people think, you know, oh, we'll, we'll go, go to university or the way it's thought about is you go to university, you graduate, you do a couple of years as a graduate, then you're an engineer, but you don't have to do it like that. I never did. And so it's, you don't have to follow the norm to get to where you need to get to either. And and that lifelong learning piece as well, going back to back to college, university to, to get another qualification and you know, continual professional development, knowledge, you know, it, every day's a school day and you learn something new every day. 
Absolutely. And the fact I started off on the tools, um, when you're designing, you de you're designing how you think you would install it. But if you've just been to university and then move forward, and, you know, some great engineers, but when it comes to uh, sometimes the practicalities of it, probably that's where I might just have uh, be just a little step forward of them. And that so so that's why experience, work experience actually on the tools and that I think has been a great help. And a few of my colleagues have followed this, have done the same thing. Um, and we're all we're all sorts of in the same place with it. We're and I say I think having a rounded experience with it all is has been really helpful. Even working for a manufacturer. I worked for a manufacturer for a few years and learning that side of the industry, which was, um, yeah, that was interesting. Good. And, and what do you think the future holds? I think um, the way climate change is increasing faster than what um, people or the scientists originally thought. I think we've We've really got to rethink and reconsider how we use and treat water in this country, because I think um, the, you can already see it's getting drier. Um, and when we do have floods, it's flash floods, it's extreme um, rainfall events more and more. And we've got to adapt to that. And I think that is one of the biggest things that um, has got to be taken on board, not only just from engineers, but um, up in the uh, down in London with the government. But I think they're miles behind everybody else, unfortunately, and just slowly starting to catch up. And global water issues and ch ch impacting our planet today. It's like I said before, it's a geographical lottery where it, where you live, um, and I think there's a again there's a lot that needs to be thought about politically um i mean land banking in places like africa and that by rich countries who basically buy up land and then they'll abstract the water from that land and they will then ship it back to their country which is a water scarce country stuff like that has got to stop it's because you know it's about it's hard enough for the people living where they are, let alone all their water being taken away from them. And so I think the whole political issue around uh, sustainability and how we treat and use the planet has, has got to change. But yeah, there's, there's that's way beyond way. our wage packet. So it's like well, uh, there's some fundamental issues that uh, we as engineers can can help to solve and, and yeah. uh, important issues both locally national and globally um that uh, yeah are, are challenges that uh, we as engineers can can rise to address but um thank you for joining us today and sharing what you have um just a couple of last questions if i may yeah um what what do you like to do in your spare time what do i like to do in my spare time um sleep um you know, now i like i love music i love reading um i i do a lot of i can't exercise like i used to because i had a bit of ill health last year so i um i get out walking every day and i just i just enjoy i, I just enjoy getting up in the morning and being here basically at the minute so it's yeah, I think post COVID, I think COVID affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways. I was lucky I kept working all through COVID. Um, but I was, um, I think, I think just enjoying the moment is the main thing for me. What was the last book you read? Um, I love historical fiction. Um, and so I read an awful lot of historical fiction and um, I'm just reading uh, a series at the moment by um, an author called Robin Young, um, which is all about the Templars and uh, and that period of time. So, yeah, just working my way. She's 
there's a, a trilogy she wrote um, a few years ago, which I'm just working my way through at the minute. Okay, good. And where can people discover more about you? Oh, LinkedIn. Got my own. Uh, we've got Pluvium Environmental, uh, which is on there, and uh, John, my colleague, and myself, we've got our own individual pages on there as well. Okay. Excellent. Well, as I said previously, thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us what you have today. If anybody watching or listening would like to share their thoughts with us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if you'd like to feature in a future episode or know of or can think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you like Alan shared, please get in touch. Please like, comment and share and we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. Thank you, Rod. Thank you.